He is worthy to be praised and He is worthy to be worshipped. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is overseeing and over all. Our God is good, amen. Come on, let's sing this out. Our God, firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. As nations rise and fall, kingdoms once strong now are shaken. We trust forever in Your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Come on, unmatched in all your wisdom. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love, just as you will reign. And every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Come on, our God is victorious, and we can carry Him wherever we go, because God lives inside of us. So the situations that we are going through, we can interject Jesus into those situations, and we can place our trust in Him because He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He oversees all. Amen. Jesus, from age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high, we lift the name of Jesus, from age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever, almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. Come on, sing it out. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. a shout of praise this morning.
but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, the treasures that fade, I never enough. But you came alone. Put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Yes, I know it's true. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing.
Man, I love that song. It's such a good one. I think that we've all had a, a situation in our area in our life whenever we have set it at God's feet and let him take care of it. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot that I've dumped at his feet. And every single time that I allowed God to take control or, or just have his way with these situations that are in my life, he always proves himself faithful each and every single time. Now, sometimes it may not be the exact way that I want it to happen, but it's in God's way. And it's in his perfect timing. And there's, no, there's nothing better than God's will and being right in the middle of it. And if you came here this morning and you've got something going on in your life, I just want to encourage you just a little bit. Sometimes it's hard to, to let go. Sometimes it's hard to place these things that are so meaningful and valuable to us at his feet. But I want to encourage you to do so because it's saying that, God, I trust you. That's a huge statement there. I love my wife more than anything on this earth. I really do. And if she was going through something, I have to say, God, I trust you enough with my most valuable possession. My most valued treasure. I trust you with it. I trust you with my kids. I trust you with my job. God's going to prove himself faithful to meet the needs in your areas that you are dealing with. So this morning, God, we come to you. We make a vow that even though it's hard, Father God, we just place it at your feet. We know that you're gonna take care of those needs. We know that you are gonna fight on our behalf. You're gonna provide for us. You're gonna heal us. You're going to bring us joy. And just like that last song said, you're going to change all of these different things. You're going to take our sorrow and turn it into gladness. You're going to take our mourning and change it to dancing. You're going to give us beauty, Lord, from our ashes. So we trust you, Lord. Jesus' name. Amen. I'm calling on the God of Jacob whose love is through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses the one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me, for me, for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who 
played a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath but I've got my own giants oh God my God I need you oh God my God I need you now now I need you now oh rock oh rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How oh, I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. It's your faithfulness I'm standing on. You hurt your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God, you are the same God, you answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same God, you were providing then, you are providing now, you are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moving power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a healer then. You are a healer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a savior then. You are a savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock, oh rock of ages. Standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How oh, I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness Yesterday, today, and forever, God, you are Oh, how I need you, Lord How I need you, Lord I'm desperate for you, God freeing hearts right now you are the same God you are the same God you touch the lepers then I feel your touch right now you are the same God you are the same God
Don't you need more of the Holy Spirit in your life? Make this your prayer this morning. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty river, come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. Come and fill me you can be seated we're going to move into a time where we're going to receive uh, communion this morning if you did not pick up one of these on your way in go ahead and raise your hand one of our ushers will get the to you here at Southridge Church, um, we serve an open communion, which means that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you will do this in remembrance of Him, you are welcome to partake in communion uh, with us uh, this morning. So I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't deal with change really good. And I'll tell you, one of the things that really bothers me is when a restaurant changes their menu. I'll just be honest, I've been salty with Logan's for like a decade now, because they got rid of the open face roast beef, which was their star. I don't know why they got rid of it, but when you mess with my meal, I get a little agitated. Now, there was a time that Jesus messed with a meal that was kind of a big deal. He, he sits in the upper room the night before he's going to give his life for the sins of the world with his 12 best friends and they're partaking in a meal that's been on the menu ever since they were born. These young Jewish men every year at Passover time had gone through the Passover ceremony. They knew what all the cups were for. They knew what all the dishes were for. They knew exactly what to say and when to say it. They knew it backwards and forwards. So there they are in the upper room with Jesus and they're going through this uh, ritual ceremony meal that reminds them of the time that God set their ancestors free from Egypt when they were in bondage and in slavery. And they, they eat this meal every year to remind them that God set them free. And at one point in the night, Jesus changes what had been their tradition for their whole lives. And he grabs a piece of bread and he says, this, this bread, it's my body given for you. And they had to be sitting around going, whoa, 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 Jesus, we're all very good Jewish boys here. We're not supposed to be doing this. You are way off script. You're, you're changing everything. What do you mean this is your body given for me? And then later in the evening, he, he takes the cup and he says, and, and this, this cup, it's the cup of the new covenant, the cup of grace that's bought and purchased with my blood. Now, here is what might have escaped the disciples on that night, but soon they would understand that what Jesus was talking about was the new exodus. It was the new escape from slavery. It was the new escape from bondage. That this meal that once said there's a lamb, there's the Passover lamb in his blood. It's what it, it caused the death angel to pass over us when we were in Egypt and, and now we're free. There's a there's a new Passover lamb, Jesus Christ who through his body and his blood introduces the new exodus the, where we walk out of slavery to sin and temptation and out of our bondage to shame and guilt. And, and so this meal, though it was a drastic change, was instituted in the new exodus, the escape from bondage that Jesus offers to each and every one of us. And so, when you take the bread, I want you to think of his body that was broken for you. When 
when you take the cup, we think of his blood that ran down the cross from his head and from his hands and from his feet. And it was the blood of the perfect Passover lamb that causes death to pass from us so we can be part of God's new creation. So we take this and we remember what Jesus has done for us and also the promise that he said that he would one day come again. Father, this morning we celebrate what you did for us, introducing the new exodus, the new escape from bondage. And I'm thankful, God, for that freedom that you paid for with your body and your blood on the cross. Lord, would you speak to us this morning? Help us to live in that freedom that you purchased for us. Help us not to live in bondage and slavery to our idols any longer. They only seek to hold us back and hold us down, but help us to experience the freedom that comes through your body and through your blood shed for us. And God, we look forward to the day when we will see you face to face as you promised. In Jesus' name, amen. But we are in a series here, our, this is our uh, summer series, um, we have titled it Sandcastles, and we've been talking about weak foundations for life, because uh, how many, has any of y'all been to the beach yet this year? Y'all just don't participate? Okay. So I could have stayed home. <laughs> there we go. So y'all been to the beach? Anybody make any sandcastles while you were there? No, I'm not a big fan. I don't like the sand at all. I don't want it on me because then it ends up in my car, then it ends up in our house all the way back in West Virginia. I don't like the sand at all. My kids like it, so sometimes they'll make sandcastles or whatever, you know. But the thing about sandcastles is that they, they don't ever last. Right? Like if you put them up, um, up close, the tide just takes them out. If you put them back where you're like, ha, huh, I'll outsmart the tide, we'll just move it back a little bit, then there's always some little snot-nosed kid on a walk that'll just kick it over, right? Either way, they just don't last because they're built on really weak foundations because sandcastles are temporary. And here's the thing, temporary things make really, really bad foundations, because they don't last. None of you would have bought your home if, if the person, the realtor goes, you know what, just put this foundation in, it's going to last about three months. You'd be like, no thank you. We want something that's going to last. We want something that's going to hold our family up, something that we can stand on. I want something temporary. I want something that's going to last. But I'm afraid that a lot of us, we've, we've built our lives on things that really don't last in the first week, Pastor Jess talked to us about how people, relationships are weak foundations for life because you know this and I know this. Relationships do come and go a lot of times. People that were such key parts of your life at one point in your life are nowhere to be found now. Oh, you thought he was the answer. You thought she was the answer to everything. Where are they at now? They turn their back on you, they lied to you, they hurt you, and now they're gone. People make really bad foundations. There are important parts of our lives, but we can't build our lives on relationships. Last week, Hope talked to us about how self-gratification and pleasure and getting all that we want in the moment, how that always leads to destruction and how that's a weak foundation for life because those pleasures, they're here one moment and they're gone the next, they're just temporary. They promise one thing, fulfillment, satisfaction, and all of that, and then they don't ever quite deliver on it. This is why so many of you, I'm going to guess, you've been on vacation, and on the way home from vacation, you're already looking for the next vacation because you realize it did not work. Whatever that vacation was supposed to do for you, you realize... I'm still kind of stressed. Especially, look, y'all know this. If you got kids, there's no such thing as vacation. You just lived somewhere else for a week. Because that is not a vacation. But like, you're on your way home, you're like, it didn't work. There's a sense in which it's like, I got to go back to work to get some rest. Right? It just doesn't, it just doesn't 
work. Like these things are temporary, temporary things. Make horrible foundations. Think about this. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But somebody in, say, the 1950s got their dream car and it's in a drunk, junkyard now. Somebody's dream car got sold for parts and is in a junkyard now. That thing they sold and sacri- they, they sacrificed and saved and everything and all that. Nobody even thinks of it anymore. Here's one that hit close to home. Uh, if you're watching online, you're not from around here. This will make no sense. But you guys know there was a beautiful house at the end of Jefferson Road, right? Everybody liked that house. That house was beautiful. Where's it at now? It's gone. Because temporary things make bad foundations because they're here one day and they're gone the next. I want to talk to you about what I think is the most dangerous temporary foundation that I think a lot of people build their lives on. And initially you'll go like, oh, I don't know if that's me, but we're going to have a test later and we'll find out. And I think that's money, wealth, the pursuit of money, or the things money can buy. Here, I mean, money is the best magician in the world. It's always doing a disappearing act. Like, I mean, if you're a business owner, you know this, especially over the last couple of uh, years, it's just been kind of crazy. Or maybe just having to put $5 <laughs> gas in your car, you're like, well, we got less money now. Because money's always doing a disappearing trick. It's here one minute, and then a bad investment, you're like, shoot, now it's gone. Or the kids grow up, and they get way more expensive as they get older. And it's like, what we had now, we don't have... Because it's temporary. It's not a good foundation. So this morning, we're going to look at three different passages. I I normally like to camp out on one, but we've got to look at three, because I want you to see the dangers that are talked about in building a life on money, the pursuit of money, or the things money can buy. Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. You can hit the QR code on the seat back in front if you want to follow along with my digital notes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, this is part of the wisdom books in the Bible, so they're, they're meant to teach us how to live in a wise way. This is what it says, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. Those who love money will never have enough. Somebody say amen. Amen. If you love money, you'll never have enough. The great John D. Rockefeller, when asked how much money is enough money, he said, just a little bit more. A man who had everything he could ever want, how much more money do you need? Just a little bit more. Because you there's a lot of us that probably don't feel very wealthy, so you're like, oh, this isn't for me. No, because you're trying to get there because you think when you get there, it's going to finally satisfy you. And what this warning is, is whether you got a lot of it now and you can already attest to it, or you're trying to strive to get a lot of it, just understand those who love money will never have enough. He says, how meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. In fact, it has the opposite effect a lot of times. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Amen? Anybody ever do pretty good in life and then all of a sudden you're like, I didn't even know I had this many cousins. (laughs) So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much. But the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Most of the commentators will say, what he's saying is, those people that have a lot, they've kind of built their lives on this, they stay up at night worrying about whether or not they're going to lose it the next day. Is the market going to turn? Is my business partner going to run out on me? Is everything going to blow up? Are we going to lose everything? And they stay up and they worry about it because it's the foundation of their life. And without it, they don't know what they are. Then he goes on, there's another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is put into risky investments that turn sour, and everything is lost. It's temporary. In the end, there's nothing left to pass on to one's children. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as, as we were on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. 
So what the writer of Ecclesiastes is telling us, he says, money makes a bad foundation because it's temporary. The pursuit of money is temporary. Even if you skate through life and none of the catastrophes happen, on your deathbed, you, you take no, none of it with you. So it's temporary. So it makes a really bad foundation. I'm going to guess there's some of you in this room and some of you watching at home that you're stuck in a job that you hate because you are pursuing money. And you might be missing God's calling on your life. I mean, I know people that have forfeited a call for some cash. I promise you it ain't worth it. Some of you have done very immoral things to get money. And in the pursuit of money. And married folks, money continues to be the number one tension point in marriages and reason for divorce. And I'm going to guess a lot of times that's because you've got two people who built a foundation on money and money and the pursuit of money and the things that money can buy, but there's two different dreams and you can't fund both dreams so you decide to go fund them on your own. And I know, I'll just be honest, church people hate talking about money. Like, they hate it. But like, what most church people don't realize is like, there's just, it's just littered throughout the Bible. It's just everywhere. So if you preach the Bible, you talk about money and possessions a lot because the Bible talks about it so much. Because it's like the guy that wrote it knew that this was going to be difficult. That it was going to be a tension point for a lot of us. So, so the, the message is not, let's, don't, don't get this wrong, the message is not that money is bad. Money's not bad, it's just temporary. We're, we're heading towards a kingdom where cash is not king. Where, where ca the currency of cash is going to be useless in the kingdom that we're headed towards. So it's not bad, it's just temporary. And then I, I love this when, when people go, well, well you know, money, money is bad. The Bible says money's bad. It, money, money's the root of all evil. How many of you have heard someone say that? Money's the root of all evil. You've got to read that verse again. That's not even what the Bible says. That ain't at all what the Bible says. Money's not evil. Money is amoral, meaning it is up to how you use it to decide the morality. It's like a shoe. When you walk in it, it's good. When you take it off, hit somebody with it, not so good. Right? Like, it's amoral. It's how we use it that matters. Money is not the root of all evil. In fact, here is actually the actual verse that um, that's alluding to. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Again, if you have the digital notes, you'll be able to find this nice and quick. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So what Paul actually says, it's not money that is the root of all evil. It's the, the unhealthy desire for money. The, the one that consumes you that takes over your life, that it's all about money and the things money can buy and it's all that I can think about. It's that that leads, it says, to many pains and ultimately towards destruction. It's like the great philosopher Notorious B.I.G. said, mo money, mo problems. Some of y'all are too old for that. I get that. Just text me later. I'll, I, well, if you don't get that, email me later. Um, I'll help you with it. But he's saying, he's saying it's this pursuit. It's, an, it's a desire that overtakes you that it's all you can think about. 
And that is what leads to so much hardship. Because you know this, your desires, more often than not, determine your behavior. Your desires left unchecked will destroy you. I mean, I bet in a room with this many people and y'all watching online, there are some crazy stories of how your desires put you into a crazy situation because you were going after what you wanted. Right? In, in, any, anybody in here done something crazy or watching online done something crazy to try to impress a boy when you were younger or a girl when you were younger? Oh, I'm sure it was just me. Okay. Yeah, so... See, for whatever reason, when I was in 10th grade, I went through a bad breakup and thought that the answer to this bad breakup was to purchase a set of white t-shirts, and on one of them, I wrote, I am different on it, and wore it to school, and then started a hunger strike to try to get this girl's attention. Because we will do crazy stuff out of desire to try to get what we want. Another time when I was in college, went through a bad breakup with a girl that was back at home, I was up in Morgantown just preface this, this was BC days, before Christ days, okay, so don't judge me, I thought it would be a good idea to get a drug problem, so the way she would tell people back, or that way people would tell her back at home, oh, Scott's all messed up doing drugs because of you, and then that would draw her back, and then all I ever did was did drugs for like five years, and it never worked. So like, we've known, I mean, I was going to tell you the stories about Megan, but she told me I absolutely better not. (laughs) But we've all, like, our desires make us do crazy, crazy things. Like my guess is some of you are in unbelievable debt right now because you couldn't tame your desire for more. Because you had to have the the car and the boat and the furniture and the clothes and all that. Like some of you, you you cannot even pay your bills because you're in such debt to everyone all over the place because you had to have more and more and more and more and more. And and you go, well, how did I end up like this? It's unchecked desire out of control. See, your desires in your control will destroy you. Your desires under the control of the Holy Spirit can develop you. Like, some of you have probably done really dangerous stuff because of your desires. I know I have. Like, you ever thought about this? You ever see like a news article or maybe read it, a paper, something happens and there will be like this totally like benign, innocent looking person that has gotten themselves into some trouble like at work or something where they've been like embezzling like millions of dollars and you're like, I cannot believe Sheila did that. I, I, I just can't believe that. It doesn't seem like her. And it's like, well, well, here's the deal. Sheila didn't start out like that. She was probably not a scoundrel or a cheater at at first, but eventually the desire for more just overtakes you, and then the desire to get what you want overtakes your desire to be a decent person. And then you fall temptation, and it gets the best of you. That's unchecked desire, and that's what Paul's writing to Timothy. He's going, people that just chase after money and can't control the need for more, They are piercing themselves with all sorts of pain and sorrow. So money is not evil, but it makes a horrible foundation. It makes a horrible foundation for life. Now, this is what makes this this topic so hard, is if we were to to ask you in front of everyone, say, hey, do you think that this is the foundation of your life? I'm going to guess 100% of the people in this room and on the other side of that camera would go, no, 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 because you know how it sounds. If you, like, I don't know anyone that's going to go, well, you know what, my life is all about money and the pursuit of money and all the things money can buy. That's all I care about. I don't know anyone that would say that because everyone would look at you like, you're awful. You're a terrible person. (laughs) All you live for is stuff. Nobody would say that. And so there's a test. How do we know if this is us? 
how do we know if we're fooling ourselves and maybe we really do have the wrong foundation and we just don't know it yet? So go with me to Mark chapter 10. Again, digital notes are the easiest way to follow along whenever I'm bouncing all over the place like this. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, says this. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So this man runs up, and, and Matthew and Luke, the other folks that write about this story, tell us that Mark just says he was a man. Matthew and Luke tell us actually this was a very rich man, and he was actually the ruler of some, something. So it's normally gotten the, the, the title, the rich young ruler. And this, he runs up to Jesus and says, how do I get eternal life? Now, and this is a, this, that, that, that phrase eternal life is, is one that, that the church really needs to do a better job of helping everyone understand what that means, because we have one idea of what that means, and it leads to a lot of bad theology. What eternal life in the original Greek actually means is life in the age to come. Life in the age to come. It wasn't just a quantity of life, it was a quality of life. And so the Jewish hope was never that God would whisk them away to some faraway place called heaven. The Jewish hope was that at the great resurrection, at the end of time, all the dead would be raised and the righteous would spend eternity in God's new creation that had been perfected back to Eden. And the unrighteous would go away. That was their hope. So what this man is running up and asking is what every Jew, good Jew wanted to know. Jesus, am I going to be with you in your new creation? Am I going to be with you when you redo all this, when you set all that is right? When, when, am, am, I, am, I, what, am I in or am I out? They, that's what they want to know. Am I in the age to come or not? So that's what he wants to know. And so Jesus responds like this. He says, first, why do you call me good? Don't you know that only God is truly good? Which, that's a weird statement for God to say. But you have to understand, in Jesus' humanness at this moment, he is trying to lead this man into a conversation that will be transformative for him. So he says, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and mother. Now this is a really interesting list if you, know, if you remember your Ten Commandments, which I'll just be honest. 9 a.m. did not know their Ten Commandments. So we got to do some work, church. So if you're familiar, you will see in order, starting with you must not murder, number six, seven, eight, nine, and then one that's not even in the first ten, which is uh, you must not cheat anyone. That's one Jesus adds to this list. And then curiously, number ten is left out, but then number five comes in at the end. Now, my guess is there's a reason, because Jesus is a master teacher, why he did this. First off, he adds in, you must not cheat anyone, most likely because the rich are always in a position to be able to get over on someone. And he's saying, if you want to be part of the age to come, in that age, we're not going to cheat people. You want to be part of the new creation? You're not, the rich are not going to take advantage of the poor. The wealthy are not going to hold it over their heads. The rich and powerful are not always going to get their way. So he tells that guy. So he adds that to it. But then there's one, curiously, that's gone. That's the 10th commandment. Anybody remember the 10th? Thank you. Y'all were so much faster than 9 a.m. I'm so proud of y'all. Do not covet, which is like, don't want what everyone else has already. So I wonder why Jesus left that one out. Two reasons. Either he has already failed that so miserably by the fact that he is so wealthy and has everything he could ever want, or that's just not an issue for him because he has everything that he wants. Either way, Jesus leaves it out of the list. And so the man responds, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a young man. So he's going like, Jesus, this is amazing. I checked all the boxes. I did it. I, I got them all right. I checked all the boxes, all those little religious boxes. Check, 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 check. Let's just be honest. That list was not that difficult. Like, I'm sorry, if you get home from work every day and you're like, well, I didn't kill anyone, and you feel good about that, you've got to raise your standard. <laughs> right? You, I mean, you've got you to, gotta, I mean, goodness gracious. It's like, well, I didn't sleep with someone that's not my wife. Great job. I mean, he's just, che it's just he's checking boxes. 
And so Jesus looks at the man and felt genuine love. I want you to remember, when Jesus looks at this man, he felt genuine love towards him. So the way you don't hear what Jesus says from a place of condemnation and shame, but you hear it from a heart of love, he looks at the man with love and says, there's still one thing you haven't done. Go and sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Jesus goes, listen, there's still one more thing. And I'm guessing if this guy really knew the Ten Commandments like he probably did, like all the Jews would have known him way better than us. He would have been like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second, Jesus, that was not on the list. That was not on the list. Where, where, tell me which one it is. You've already told me five, six, seven, eight, and nine. You already added don't cheat on me. I mean, how, much, how many more boxes do I have to check? This whole sell all my possessions, give it to the poor, that's not on the list, Jesus. Now imagine if that had been his response, Jesus would have said, oh no, this one's on the list. This is on the list. It it sounds like this. You shall have no other gods before me. Because what Jesus is walking this guy towards is, nice work, you check some boxes, and all that you have demonstrated is the ability of religious people to check boxes without ever surrendering their heart to God. Yep, you came to church, you read your Bible, you gave your check, you served in the nursery, check box, check box. And Jesus is demonstrating through this man the ability to check boxes as a religious person and still have your heart desperately far from God. Because something else had a hold of his heart. Here's the problem. Here's what this man is facing. It's not... It's not bad that he has stuff. I don't want you to hear that. I don't want you to leave and go like, sell it all, we're done, sell the house, we're moving it. You know, like, no, that's not the point of the story. It wasn't that this man had stuff. It's that this man's stuff had him. It was, it was like Jesus has this ability to pinpoint that one thing in your life that he knows that you can't live without. And he goes, if you want to know the foundation of your life, tell me the thing that you would say no to, and that's your foundation. Tell me the one thing that's off limits, that's the area you're not trusting me, and that's the area that's holding you back. See, this man wanted to know, how do I get into the age to come? but he couldn't let go of the present age. He couldn't let go of all that he had accumulated in this age to be able to receive what God had for him in the next. He was holding on to it. For some of you, it is your money and your possessions and the pursuit of it and all this. Some of you, it's, it's relationships that you know are not in alignment with the word of God. Uh, some, some of you, it's just opinions and worldviews that you have. You're like, no, Jesus, I'm not changing that. It could be different for all of us. But Jesus has pinpointed for this man his sensitive spot, the spot he knows is unsurrendered. And he says, if you want to partake in the age to come, let go of the present age. Live for what's ahead that will last and get rid of the temporary. So, no, I don't think anyone's going to admit that Yes, I'm all about possessions and money and wealth. But how do I know what my foundation is? Well, imagine Jesus standing before you with all the love that he is embodied. He says, it's this, whatever that thing is in your life, You haven't laid it down yet. 
and it's robbing you from what's ahead of you. And whatever that thing is, is the thing that has your heart. And it's the thing that's robbing you of the age to come because you're holding on to the present age. For this man, it was his wealth and his possessions. It could be any number of things for you and for me. So what would you do if he stood before you and demanded it all? You lay it down? Or like this man? said, Jesus... It's just too far. You're asking too much of me. Just walk away. Now, this is, as you, I mean, the church is not asking for money, by the way. We haven't passed an offering plate in like three years. If you're giving, thank you. You're being faithful. Thank you for that. But now, here... So just, I just want to preface that because I'm not asking you to start tithing. If you want, that'd be great, but whatever. It's, I mean, people at church get bent out of shape when we talk about giving to the church. Like, they get real bent out of shape. I don't get, I mean, I never get complaints from people unless we talk about money at church. Just so interesting to me. So like when we do the tithing talk and we talk about like how if you're a follower of Jesus, you know, the bare minimum, 10%, all that, people get bent out of shape. And I'm telling you, this sermon is not about tithing. Because I'm asking you, what if Jesus stood before you and didn't just ask for 10%, but asked for it all? Like, like what if he stood before you and said, listen, your house is your idol, I want you to downsize. Your neighborhood is your idol. You want to live in this area of Charleston, but I need a light in this area. I want you to move. Your kids are in this school district, but I need them to be here because I need someone for these kids. Or, or, or I need you to just uproot your whole life, head off to Africa because someone there needs you. My guess is most everyone will be like, let me just tithe. Wait, can, we, can we do the 10% thing? Let's go back to the 10% thing, Jesus. I don't, I don't want to move house. I don't, I don't want to go be a missionary. I don't want to give it all. Let me do the 10% thing, Jesus. What, what if he demanded the relationship? This is something God has been just burdening my heart with so much. And I've, I've, been, I've been here almost 11 years now. So I've seen a lot. This burns my heart so much. You want to know one of the reasons why it's so difficult to build a church in West Virginia? Because the people of West Virginia, for the most part, not everyone, so if this isn't true of you, just let it slide off your back. But this is going to be true for a lot of you. People in West Virginia are always trying to look for a way to get out of West Virginia. And I know so many young people that all the devil had to do was offer them a job in another town and they uprooted where God had them planted and they took off. It's so, like, it's so difficult to watch that happen. Now, if the Lord's telling you to go, you got to go. But I'm saying sometimes the most godly thing that we can do is stay. And say, I'm putting roots down because the kingdom of God is necessary right where I'm at. And I'm not just going and chasing every opportunity that might get me further away from the will of God when he's already planted me where I'm supposed to be. And I'm supposed to pour in here. This is why Megan and I have committed to this church. I get told by people in ministry all the time, you've been in the same place 11 years? What are you doing there? I'm here to stay because God wants to do something special here. We're putting roots down. 
And, and we're looking for people to do it with us. Not one that will just answer the next phone call because, uh, I'll, let me go ahead and save you the time. All the other cities pay more, okay? But what if it's not about money, but it's about calling? So if he stood in front of you and asked for it all, what would you say? I think some of you, you'll be like, this sounds pretty difficult. And that's exactly what Jesus says next. He says, verse 23, he looks around at his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And this amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it's very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So if it sounds hard, it's because it is. And this isn't a tithing message because we're, Jesus isn't after just 10%. He's after your whole heart. He wants it all. Whatever it is that is off limits to him, he's trying to break the doors down today. He wants a wholehearted commitment from his people. No holding back. No, sorry, Jesus, you can't have access over here. He wants access to it all to where if he was standing in front of you and he demanded it now what would you say is there anything off limits and if there is you have found your foundation and it's time to trade it in for a better foundation one that will last one that will not shake when the world is shaking one that will not crumble and one that will not crack a kingdom that will never be shaken. A foundation that will hold you and your family up no matter what you're going through. Build your life on Jesus. It says in Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God. All these other things will be added unto you. Following Jesus is not a vow of poverty. It's just having the right priorities. If you need to have a foundation check this morning, these altars are open for you on both sides. If you want to speak with someone, go back to the prayer room. We'd love to talk to you there. Father, I'm going to ask that you do what only you can do. You would reveal our foundations, those that are cracked and shattered, those that are weak and feeble, and give us the strength to trade them in. That we might build our life solely on you and make you the sole focus of our life in Jesus' name.